Well on people, this presentation is called Bible, Myths, Legends Found in Other Places. People who fear thinking shouldn't have a brain. First question, who is this supposed to be again? Who is this supposed to be again? And while you're guesstimating, who that could possibly be, we're going to swiftly just cover a few things in detail before we start looking at stories, myths, legends in other places. I want to clear up something first though. I think it's, in a, it's important to clear up a few things first before we get into the meat of it. Where you're born is generally how you think. If you're born in Jamaica, you have a Jamaican mentality, India, Indian mentality, Pakistan, Pakistani mentality, America, American mentality, Uruguay, Uruguay mentality, Mexico, Mexican mentality. So where you're born is similar to how you think. Where you're born is just similar to how you think. Many people then, I've confined God to a book and assert that if you don't believe in their book, you don't believe in God. Is there any facts in that statement? Have you been guilty of doing that to somebody else or accusing somebody because they disagree with your book, a verse, a chapter, a word or words? Have you gone to the extent of saying this, that and the other? So many people have confined God to a book and assert if you don't believe in their book you don't believe in God. But is there any evidences for God? Is there any book that testifies of God? People who fear thinking shouldn't have a brain. If you were to uh, give it evidence for God, what would you go to? What book, what chapter, what verse of a, of a sacred text? So the Muslim would go probably to a Quran, a Christian, Hebrew, Jew would go to um, the Bible, the Torah, the Talmud, they'll go to something. But is there a book that is evidential for God? Is there any other proof for a God or the gods? If these books were to like vanish one day, how would these things be proven? So God or gods do exist. We are evidence of a superior intelligence. Did you know that the human genome has been referred to as the book of life, containing all the necessary instructions to build a human? So God or gods do exist. We are evidence of a superior intelligence. There's evidence. We are spiritual, rational, physical, emotional beings. There's evidence. So using the Bible or any other religious text to prove the religious text is sometimes likened to circular reasoning or begging the question. It's akin to using a statement to support itself without external validation. Does this approach lack objectivity? Can you use Batman to prove Spider-Man? Spider-Man to prove Catwoman? Does, the, does that approach lack objectivity? Now, if there was no God, people would definitely invent one. If there was no God today, no book, no this, no that, 
people would invent one. You know why? There's too many questions that need to be asked. What are we doing here? Why are we here? Where are we going from here? They're the three questions that everybody asks. Generally speaking, when it gets deep, when you're at a funeral, when you're like contemplating life in more detail, you're like, yo, what's the point of living? Where are we going after here? If there's anywhere after here? And what are we supposed to do while we're here, yeah? And every time we see in the scriptures or you see in someone's book or in this or that, they say stuff about idolatry. Don't make no idols. Don't make no idols. Don't make no idols. If there was no God, people would invent one. That's just pretty plain as Jane. Think about it though. Think about, think about it, think about it. If there was no God, people would invent one. And people have been inventing or conceptualizing gods for ages for people to adhere to in the name of the God that they've created or in the name of the God that they think is the true God because their God is better than your God and your God's not better than their God. Blah, blah, blah. We're going to break this presentation down into three pieces. We're going to look at parallels of the Bible with other books and stories. Then we're going to look at other places where we can find the same stories. So I guess it's a second part of the parallel. And then at the latter part, we're going to see um, again. We're, we're going to see more comparisons in terms of like we're going to look at the firmament in other places. We're going to look at the God structure in other places that parallels this structure too. People with fear thinking should not have a brain. Bible myths, legends found in other places. Bruno Boyer, he suggested that biblical narratives were not unique, but were adaptations or borrowings from other ancient myths and legends. This idea, known as Angloia or Analogia Scriptura or Analogy of Scripture, proposes that the themes, motifs and narratives found in the Bible can be found in other cultures and religions throughout the world. He wrote some very interesting stuff, but we're going to look at him when we look at another presentation. But we're going to look at a lot of scholars and what they had to say regarding the so-called Passover and the so-called Exodus account. Biblical scholars, secular scholars, other religious scholars, just looking at a variety of scholars and what they had to say regarding the Exodus account, Jewish scholars, Hebrew scholars, a plethora of scholars. 17th, 18th, 19th century. All right. But this guy suggested that the biblical narratives were not unique, but were adaptations. So we're going to see if we can find more of these stories in other places. Another question too. Before you have the Passover account, or should I say before you have like um, the Holocaust account, which is very, very bad and is very um, wicked and evil and it was not a good thing, right? Okay. So before you had that event, what was like the archetypal Holocaust before that Holocaust event where a nation was just being mistreated and conditioned to such inhumane treatment and now it becomes a yearly festival that we have to remind ourselves about this inhumane treatment it's the passover right passover big festival where they passed over passed over passed over right so in my opinion which is not a fact i feel like the passover is like an example of a earlier a low cost example where people have used a narrative to help them establish themselves. But I won't say anymore. Now, just to just to move on a little bit. Who is this supposed to be again? Who is this supposed to be again? Who is this supposed to be again? They say a picture says a thousand words, right? So notice this picture is not saying anything. It's not talking to you. There's no words on the screen on top of the image. You know, I know there's words on the screen adjacent to the image, but there's no captions on the image saying what it is, what it isn't. But just by looking at this image alone, what is it? Who is it? 
so on and so forth. So somebody said, Jesus, thank you for the participation. There's 27 other people not saying nothing. <laughs> but if you could add to the conversation, that would help as we go through. So I'm going to just literally pause to there's more engagement. All right, big up Peewee Free. Uh, he said it is Jesus. Notice I haven't said that this is Jesus. I haven't had no captions on there saying Jesus or Yahushua or anything along those lines. Yeah, I've just put one image on the screen. People are saying what they see, what comes to mind, you know? Just by an image, all right? So Jesus, Jesus, anyone else? Judgment Day, that's good. So that's maybe a Judgment Day scene. Uh, somebody said it's Moses or it's Jesus. Uh, Rachel resorted to saying white Jesus. <laughs> All right, let's, let's change the tone. If I could black him up, I would black him up for people or brown him up. But who is that? Uh, somebody said Constantine. Hmm, okay, so the answers are starting to get a bit diverse. So we've had Moses and Jesus, Constantine. Uh, had somebody say Sage of Borgia, exalted higher up. That's a good observation, man. That's a good, good observation. Clouds at his feet, he's about to be taken up to heaven. Interesting. All right, let's get on with it, shall we? So we'll just get on with it. We'll get on with it. Um, somebody said halo around his head. Cool. So I'm going to go back to my quote then. He suggested biblical narratives were not unique, but were adaptations or borrowings from other ancient myths and legends. This idea is known as and proposes that themes, motives and narratives found in the Bible can be found in other cultures, religions throughout the ancient world. All right, then. So let's see if we can find this. Let's put this scientific method to the test. So science, the systemic study of structure and behavior of physical and natural world. Through observation, experimentation, and the testing of theories against the evidence obtained. Now, when you look at the, the word science in the Old Testament, then it says madar or madar. So let's get madar today, right? Let's go madar according to that uh, wordage or verbiage, right? And when you check out what that madar means, it means intelligence. Be careful of people who don't want you to have any intelligence or to be conscious or have any consciousness or knowledge or science or thought. So in the Old Testament, that's what it alludes to. In the New Testament, it says gnosis. That means knowing, the act that is by implication, knowledge. And then it says science falsely called. But science falsely called, then it breaks down what it is from what it isn't. But truth be told, science helps your conscience. Conscience. Conscience is a person's moral sense of right and wrong, viewed as acting as a guide to one's behavior. So conscience is a person's moral sense of right and wrong, and science is a systemic study of structure, behavior, physical and natural world through observation, experimentation, testing of theories against evidence obtained. So let's test out his theory then. He's put a theory out there, Let's see if this theory has any weight. So he suggested that you can find these stories in other places. Let's see if we can find them. I asked you a question. Who is this guy? Who is this guy supposed to be again? Who is he supposed to be again? Jesus, Moses. Um, I've had a, a plethora of answers. Some Roman emperor. Very, 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 very detailed response there. Very specific. Some Roman, I mean emperor. Big up Jeezy. <laughs> I kid. But yo, man, we've had a varied response then. Cool. So who is he then? Who is he? I'm going to I'm gonna guess then. I think this guy, I think this guy could be Romulus. Oh, huh, it's Romulus. So Romulus is a Roman. Uh, it's a parallel to the ascension of Jesus. So Acts 1, 9, 11. Hmm, 9, 11. Anyway, details. Romulus, the founder of Rome, was believed to have ascended to heaven, watched by eyewitnesses after his death, similar to Jesus' ascension to heaven. Romulus and Remus is the story or the mythology or the legend to the establishment of Rome. Which this story kind of predates the Jesus story. Um, but it's just showing you the images, the iconography of Romulus. A cloud taking him out of their sight. He's being ascended to the pantheon of the gods in the heavenly realm. So it's just quite fascinating, interesting. 
Okay, let's continue, let's advance. So the person in the sky on that one wasn't Jesus, unfortunately, Caesar Borgia, or any of the other people that were mentioned, Moses and some Roman emperor. Well, basically some Roman emperor, but it's Romulus. Um, so that's cool. But I can see why you'd make the comparison. So I'm not gonna hold it against you. I could see. So we're, we're doing this from a scientific perspective. We're testing out the theory with the evidences. We're gonna look at the we're gonna look at his proposed the theory. Now we need to look at the evidence. There needs to be a methodology. And when you ask people questions to to prove things, they always say faith, or they they use some kind of buzzword to be lazy or to dismiss it or to make you sound like a bad guy because you're questioning. They'll even ask, why do you question? Why are you thinking, basically, is what they're saying. When I hear that, I cringe. Like, why are you telling me I can't think, I can't question? I, I encourage my children to ask me questions. I encourage my children to think. In fact, my, my children ask too much questions, but I still encourage them to ask them. Now, let's continue. So here's another story then, parallel. Um, in Greek mythology, you have Pandora. She was the first woman on earth created by the gods. Each god gave her a gift. And she was also given a box, often referred to as a jar, and warned never to open it. Temptation got the better of her, and she opened the box, releasing all the evils into the world. But also hope. At first, the tribes of men had lived upon earth, apart and free of all evils, or free of evils. And a tiresome toil and hard diseases, which have brought to men their doom because by hardship mortal men are quickly aged but with their hands but with her hands the woman raised the jar's great lid released all devising grievous cares for men darn them women and you know when people get into certain religions they become very sexist and they just seem to hate women and do all kinds of stuff and say all kinds of stuff and it's kind of weird and, and there's a lot of um Hey, I won't get into that just yet. I'll build the case. It's on evidence. So, and the Lord God said unto the woman, what is it that thou hast done? And the woman said, the serpent beguiled me and I did eat. Then you have the Pandora story. And again, the woman is like the arch enemy that brings weakness on the world, which is interesting. Now, let's keep going. When we talk about iconography then, did you know if you go back to 1432, you go to Belgium, there's a museum and you can see images of Mary, Jesus and John and Micah, the Ghent, outer piece also called the adoration of the mystic lamb is a very large and complex 15th century uh, poly patuk outer piece in saint uh, babel's cathedral ghent in belgium and these are the images so when people are talking about this um russian thing and all this kind of hype 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 these are some other images that you can see as well just for i let you know all right so let's go a little bit more then looking at these parallels so in the Egyptian text, it talks about a sky being separated from the earth for you. The ladder has been set up for you so that you may ascend to the sky. Pyramid text, the utterance is 210. Then when you go to the Hebrew text, it says, and he dreamed and behold, a ladder set on the earth and the top of it reached to the heaven and behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. Great stuff. Then when you go to the... Early History of Heaven by J. Edward Wright. He says, the celestial ladder, the gate of heaven, Genesis. So he's quoting Genesis. And then he says, observes that the ladder, the ladder may be parallel to the long staircase of heaven mentioned in the myth of Nurgle, a Reshikikau, whose summit is at the gate of Anu, Anil. The celestial ladder, ladder and the gate of heaven, then he references Genesis, suggests that the ladder finds its parallel in the Egyptian pyramid texts that speak of the deceased and go into heaven or going up the ladder or something like that so i'm just showing you there you got jacob having a dream or yakuba or whoever he is he's having a dream about angels going up and down on jacob's ladder or some kind of ladder right but you have other stories talking about the same ladder thing where entities are going up and down in the egyptian text then you see this text all right so there's another parallel let's see if there's any more there so this is Gilgamesh, snake and the immortal plant. So Gilgamesh, snake and the immortal plant, the plant's name is the old man, becomes a young man. Then I will eat it and return to the condition of my youth. At 20 leagues they broke for some food, at 30 leagues they stopped for the night. Seeing a spring and how cool its waters were, 
Gilgamesh went down and was bathing in the water. A snake smelled the fragrance of the plant, silently came up and carried off the plant. While going back it scoffed, it, sl it sloughed off its casing. At that point, Gilgamesh sat down weeping. The biblical story in the book of Genesis, a serpent tempts Eve in the Garden of Eden, leading to the fall of man, the explosion of Adam and Eve from paradise. But you can see the parallels with it, with a snake taking the immortal plant or fruit, fruit, whatever. And Gilgamesh apparently tries to grab onto the snake. As he grabs onto the snake, the snake sheds its skin, showing you that you can't trust the snake, that the story in the allegory or the mythology or the legend is teaching you that things that you hold precious, people want to take that off you. And that you shouldn't trust a snake because a snake will shed its skin. You can make many kind of different moral stories out of that one narration. But essentially, this guy has a wash and a snake rubs his immortal plant. And, of, and, he, and he's weeping, he's crying because he's lost his immortality due to the snake. Interesting. All right, so when we look at human clay and dust and the creation of man, so when you go to the Sumerian myth, the god Enki, along with the goddess, pay attention to that. The god Enki, along with the goddess Ninmar, creates various beings out of clay. One of these beings is a man called Enkidu, who is created from clay and brought to life by the gods. Genesis 1.26, and God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So in the same account, in the Sumerians, you have the gods, male and female, god and goddess, creating humans. Then in the Genesis account, it's a bit ambiguous, but it says, let us make man in our image. So plura pl plurality and after our likeness, plurality. And it says, form man out of the dust of the ground. So ground, dust, clay. And then the man became a living soul. You also have the story of Prometheus. He shaped man out of the mud and Athena breathed life into the clay figure. Prometheus made man to stand upright as the gods did and gave them fire. Lastly, in the Yoruba mythology, you have the god Obatala. Obatala was instructed by the supreme god Olaron, also known as Oludeme, to create human beings from clay while performing his sacred duty, Obatala grew thirsty and drank palm wine, which led to his intoxication. Due to his inebriated state, some of the humans he moulded turned out to be imperfect. These imperfections are often interpreted as physical disabilities. After Obatala finished moulding the human figures, Oleron breathed life into them, bringing them to life. All right, let's look at the myth of Baal and Yam. So parallel to the conquest of Canaan, Joshua details the Baal cycle from the Ugaritic text involves the god Baal defeating his enemies and establishing his rule, reflecting the themes of conquest and divine aid found in the story of Joshua's conquest of Canaan. So you have the ancient Near Eastern texts relating to the Old Testament. Notice how these people know, like, yeah, mm, interesting. Ancient Near East texts relating to the Old Testament, edited by James B. Pritchard. Third edition, and with supplement, Myths of Baal and Yarm, Princeton, New Jersey, Princeton University Press, 1969. Third edition, this is. Near East texts relating to the Old Testament. Myths of Baal and Yam, or Baal and Yam. Remember I told you when people go to seminary school, they're, they're given a lot more books than, than the average person and they're given all, a lot of these supplemental information. They know that a lot of things are mythology and legends. But it, it, it will disturb the bread balance, you know, the daily bread of offerings and tithes and all that kind of mental manipulation for the congregation for salvation. 
Well, a lot of pe a lot of them know that there's myths involved. And the reason to go to seminary school, in my opinion, is to have these arguments presented to them so that they can then maybe dismiss or if somebody stumbles onto them they can close down the conversation because they don't want to disturb the congregation but anyway the myth of Baal and Yam relating to the Old Testament cool now you have uh, Sharupak Mesopotamian literature so Bible Proverbs Ecclesiastes Songs of Solomon the wisdom of literature of the Bible offers insights into ethics morality and the human condition Mesopotamian wisdom literature and Mesopotamian texts like the instructions of Sherpak The instructions of Surupak and the dialogue of pessimism contain wisdom, sayings, advice and reflections of life echoing themes found in the biblical wisdom literature Then you have the code of Hamu Rabbi, who is a Babylonian king. The authorship, the code of Hamu Rabbi, is attributed to the Babylonian king Hamu Rabbi, who ruled from 1792 BCE to 1750 BCE. It was written on a stele, a large stone mon monument, and is one of the earliest known written legal codes, the Hamu Rabbi. King of Babylon and let's see some interesting parallels so one of his laws was if a man put out the eye of another man his eye should be put out if a builder builds a house for someone and does not construct it properly and the house which he built falls and kills its owner then the builder shall be put to death if a man rent an ox and kills it by neglect or blows he shall compensate the owner ox for ox now the code of Hammurabi is generally dated to around 1754 BCE or 1762 BCE. Comparatively, the traditional dating of the biblical Exodus during the during which Moses received the Ten Commandments is often placed around the 13th to the 12th century BCE. For the exact dating is debated among scholars. Therefore, the code of Hammurabi predates the biblical Ten Commandments by approximately 500 to 700 years it's important to note as well that the whole exodus story being written down was about 400 years after the so-called event took place which is also fascinating a lot of time to get, get stories and formulate stories don't you think but anyway, I don't want to upset people to think because thinking is illegal. Now, let's continue a little bit more. Let's go to Amen E OP Wisdom. Amen E OP Wisdom. So, Amen E OP Wisdom, the son of Han Akti, is the ostensibly author of the instruction of Amen M O P, an Egyptian wisdom text written in Ramesside. Now, it says, Give your ears. Hear what is said. Give your mind to interpret them. To put them in your heart is worthwhile. Then Proverbs. Pay attention and turn your ear to the sayings of the wise. Apply your heart to what I teach, for it is pleasing when you keep them in your heart and have all of them ready on your lips, so that your trust may be in the Lord I teach you today, even you. Let's go to this then. It says, if we accept, are we obliged to accept the idea that this part of Proverbs is based on Amen e Omep? 
Could there have been a preference for 30 chapters as the ideal form of a wisdom book? I do not know of one, but there might be a connection with the Egyptian court of 30, which has been suggested as a possible prototype for David's 30 or for David's hero heroic 30. <laughs> so these scholars know Wagwan and where they were getting their inspirations from to make their little books. If we accept, are we obliged to accept the idea that this part of the Proverbs is based on and many mopi? Could there be a preference of 30 chapters as the ideal form of a wisdom book? It's not even it's not even that deep, you know, of being a copycat and this, that and the other. All nations are borrowed from each other's nations. Morality and the world was a lot more connected than people think. It's only started to get segregated and hollered, segregated, this segregated, that segregated. Back in the day the world was a little bit more connected than people give it credit to, and the world is a little bit more sensible than we give it credit to too. If I have a law that says don't sleep with your mum and then you have a law that says don't sleep with your mum I haven't copied your law it's just a principle that you have written down and then I've said you know what let me write it down too so it's not necessarily copying it's more appreciation and a lot of people want to be the original originators but to be fair nothing's really original but let's continue in the west we have an idea where we want to be the first for everything and then if we're the first, we think we're the best, we're the greatest because we did it first. We're the best because we said it first. We heard it first. We shared it first. And that's the mentality of the West, which is very self-defeating. Other societies never operated like that. They're like, oh, you've, you've found that principle helps your people. I'm going to incorporate that into my people. Oh, you've found that principle helps your people. Oh, can I use that into my, yeah, sure. And this is how you can better that development and better that insertion. Where the West is like, I did it first. It's like very narcissistic and a bit crazy. So let's see some verses that allude to the firmament. Let's see some verses that allude to the firmament. Oh, also as well, on the, on the, <laughs> on the point of um, the Most High, we're going to see that the Most High is not an exclusive term either. So when we're talking Most High, and again, I have no, I don't care what people say and do, you know, because I know that people will learn, and as they learn, they will edit and grow, because that's what growing is. I don't put limitations on people, I don't gatekeep people, people are free to think, you understand? Um, but we're going to look that there's multiple usages for Most High as well, which is neither here or there. It's not an evil thing to say Most High, but I just want to show you that there's more applications for Most High too. So we'll continue and we'll see that towards the end. Now, let's keep going. So in the Enuma Elish, he split her, the tie map, open like a shellfish into two parts. Half of her was self and made into the sky. Heavens as a roof he suspended, pulled down the bar and posted guards. Other versions say he stretched out the heavens like a curtain and spread them out like a tent to dwell in, but I never found that one. So I was like, mm, no. But the one, the one above is why it says he split her, Taima, this entity, but the entity could be a symbol, so symbolic. A lot of, you'll find a lot of the stories and allegories of old always kind of used a beast or an animal or something like that metaphorically speaking right so he says he split her the time out open like a shellfish into two parts half of her he set up and made into the sky so this is separating the waters from the waters heaven as a roof he suspended pulled down the bar and posted gods there you got your pillars yeah so you can read it literally like oh posted gods uh what else is on there that you could read literally a shellfish in the sky 
you know, or you can see it as symbolic and metaphorical, allegorical, what, what not, what have you. All right, now with the Bible. It is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth, the inhabitants thereof, or as grasshoppers, that stretcheth out the heavens as a curtain, and spreadeth them as a tent to dwell in. And then you also have separating the waters from the waters. You could add another one too. Fascinatingly though, when you look at different translations of this same verse, you get like a plethora of different things that are thrown into the verse. So uh, if you go to the Aramaic, you have the sphere. If you go to the Septuagint, you have the circle. If you go to the contemporary English version, you have the whole earth. If you go to the Rames Bible, you have the globe. If you go to the NASB 1977, you have the vault. Uh, so you can see that the Bible does change and updates like Michael's windows. But again, I don't want to set people and, uh, you know, whatever. So you have sphere, circle, whole earth, globe and vault. Yeah. And uh, when you go to this one. But anyway, I just want you to see that there's different um, words that can do a lot or infer a lot, you know, vote. Okay, that's a bit ambiguous. Circle, okay, that's a little bit more specific. Whole earth, that's a bit ambiguous. Globe, okay, that's very specific. Sphere, that's very specific. You get me? So you can have all these things. So more updates than mobile software. But let's continue. So you have the Rig Veda, the Hindu. He who measured out the broad earth have fixed the heavens mid-region fast and firm. Beyond it, he have held aloft the sky. Beyond it, he have held aloft the sky. Somebody got upset because I said it's had more updates than a mobile software. It has. What's the issue? Now, there you go. So then you have that. Because somebody said to me the other day as well, so what are you saying? The firmament's not real then? Because if you follow the Bible, if you do this, you do that. I said, bro, I can find the firmament being real in other sources. The Bible doesn't have the monopoly on the structure of the earth. Unfortunately. The Bible has a lot of good things in there. It doesn't have the, the, the monopoly on, on world history. And if it does, it's from a history, from a, a particular nation's perspective. And a lot of it is embellishments, a lot of it is mythology, a lot of it is legends. And some of it's even allegorical. So, in the Hindu again, or Hindustan, or the Rig Veda, he who measured out the broad earth have fixed the heavens mid-region fast and firm. Beyond it, he have held aloft the sky. Then you go to Egyptian mythology. The sky is personified by the goddess Nut, who arches over the earth, god Geb. Nut's body forms the firmament, and she swallows the sun in the evening and gives birth to it in the morning, thus maintaining the cycle of day and night. Now, question. Is really a woman floating in the sky with her arms arched over the earth? Is there really that? Is there really a woman up there doing that? Maybe, you know, maybe. But have you seen her? Because I haven't. Or is this more metaphorical language? I'll leave that to you because I know people read things too literally or they read things too, too, too. But it's up to you. You you do. It's okay. How you see that? That's you. So anyway, this woman, she arches over the earth. Her body forms the firmament and she swallows the sun. Does she swallow the sun? Is she swallowing the sun in the evening? What could that mean? What could it mean that she swallows the sun? Does it mean that the sun goes into her mouth 
and then as the sun goes into her mouth she gives birth to it in the morning does it mean the literal reading of what it's saying literally or could it be a symbolic as if like it's symbolic isn't it good and maintaining the cycle of day and night okay so it's just what people use because when you use symbols people can see what you're talking about and it helps them to convey the message it helps convey a message when you use analogies and, and metaphors it helps people to visualize internally and conceptualize what you're saying so a lot of the words and stuff that you see in the ancient world you do see a lot of symbols and you can misread them and miscomprehend them and demonize things inappropriately now here's the next one showing the same image i'll make it a bit bigger so you got the stars outside of the firmament and stars actually in the firmament Then you have Norse mythology. In Norse mythology, you have Ymir and the creation of the world. In Norse mythology, the world is created from the body of the primordial giant Ymir. The gods Odin, Vivili, and V use Ymir's school to create the dome, to create the sky, sorry. The sky is a solid dome, and the stars are made from the sparks of the primi primordial fire. bit graphic of a story but it's still giving the same um, event but in a different way this is like an 18 version of the story this is more of like a pg u version of the story but essentially it's just a metaphor symbolizing the formation of the uh, the firmament or the dome so then you have the homer homeric the homeric or the Hesodic tradition, the ancient Greeks envisioned the sky as a solid dome, often described as made of brass or iron, held up by the Titan Atlas. Now, a lot of people would have heard of that story, right? Titan Atlas. The firmament in Greek mythology is not as prominently featured as in Near Eastern traditions, but still reflects a similar belief in a solid structure separating the heavens from the earth. So the ancient Greeks envisioned the sky as a solid dome, often described as made of brass or iron. Now, is the sky made of brass or iron? No. What could that be suggesting? A metaphor. What could that be suggesting? That it's impenetrable or that it's tough or that it's, it has some substance to it? Held up by the Titan Atlas. So is there a person now? Is there a Titan now holding the sky in the sky? <laughs> or is it symbolic? So the firmament in Greek mythology is not predominantly featured as in Near Eastern traditions, but still reflects a similar belief in a solid structure separating the heavens from the earth. Interesting. Now, here is a few images of this guy. So here's Atlas. He's gone for a bit of a up updates, like Windows or like mobile software. So even some, some, some metaphors get updated a little bit as well. So I'll show you the update. Here he is holding up the literal firmament. In my opinion, he's holding up the sky. And here he is standing on the globe or what have you, as, as, it's, as it's called, right? The globe. But he's holding up the sky. So that don't even make no sense, really. But I'll leave that to people. And then this one here, though, if you see the moon, you can see the sun and he's standing on the, the globe but he's holding up the firmament <laughs> yo that's mad but what i like about these two at least he's holding up the firmament like he's holding up the firmament he's holding up the firmament he's standing on the globe thing or the circle that we the globe thing the spinning ball thing he's standing on the spinning ball thing and then he's holding up the firmament yeah you see that i'm not making that up you can see that with your eyes right so he's holding up the sky He's standing on a ball. He's standing on a football. He's holding up the sky. 
there's the sun, there's the moon outside of the football. All right, you can see that, right? Then on this one, then it changes. So he's holding up the ball, and then he's standing on something. <laughs> anyway, it's just the way they, they flipped it. They literally flipped it. It's interesting. But um, yeah, they flipped the whole thing. So standing on the earth, holding a firmament, and then this one holding a globe. All right, we shared this one last time. So in the pursuit of wisdom, Odin hangs himself from the branches of the Yggdrasil, the world tree, for nine days and nine nights. He does this as a sacrifice to himself, piercing his side with a spear. He hangs on a tree, his flesh is pierced with a spear at the side, the blood falls out, so on and so forth. And um, we've looked at this one already. In both cases, the sacrifice of the divine figure results in a profound spiritual benefit for others. Odin's pain and suffering brings wisdom and enlightenment to the gods, while Jesus' sacrifice brings salvation and reconciliation to humanity. So we looked at the Odin and uh, being hung on a tree, piercing side, spear, blood, etc. Also, this story of Odin incidentally predates going to the oral traditions which is a tradition it's not really a fact is it it's a tradition but they say allegedly it predates the jesus account so it is what it is anyway let's see another interesting story you have man like hermes greek mythology hermes is associated with herding livestock particularly as a protector of shepherds and flocks he's depicted as agile quick-witted qualities that will be advantageous for tending to and protecting sheep both in literature and cult Hermes was constantly associated with the protection of cattle and sheep. All right. You go to Jesus, Bible, um, New Testament, where you see the, the Gospels and so on and so forth. Uh, John 10, 27. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. Why does this thing keep cutting off on the screen though? Let's make it. So it doesn't cut off all the time. All right. I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and I'm known of mine. Then you have the story of King David. David is famously known as a shepherd before he became the king of Israel. His role as a shepherd is significant in biblical narratives symbolizing care, leadership and protection. Similar to Hermes, often associated with pastoral care and is considered a protector of shepherds, flocks, livestock. In this role, Hermes ensures the safety and prosperity of the herds. So you can kind of see the same kind of parallelism. Remember the guy said that you can find, well, you, we're just trying a method. We've got a theory, someone gave us a theory. So now we're doing a scientific method of investigation. We're trying to see if there's any credibility behind what that guy has said. If you want to, if you want to go back to what the guy has said, let's go back to that. So the guy has said, he suggested that the biblical narratives were not unique, but were adaptations or borrowings from other ancient myths and legends. This idea proposes that themes, motives, and narratives found in the Bible can be found in other cultures and religions throughout the ancient world. Interesting. So we've gone through a few already. You also have the Hyksos explosion and the Hebrew Exodus. So the Hyksos expulsion. The Hyksos were expelled through military campaigns and battles. Their retreat was forced 
and the Hyksos suffered losses as they were driven out of Egypt by a guy called uh, Moses. Then you have the Hebrew Exodus. According to the biblical narrative, the Hebrews left Egypt initially under a temporary truce that was broken by the Pharaoh. Their departure involved Moses and divine intervention, specifically the parting of the Red Sea, resulting in the destruction of the Egyptian army. The historical context of the Hyksos period provides a possible backdrop for understanding the cultural and historical influences on the biblical narrative. The themes of foreign rule, cultural exchange and eventual expulsion resonate with the biblical story of the Hebrews in Egypt, suggesting that the memory of the Hyksos period could have influenced the later Hebrew storytelling traditions. All right, so this is the tale of Panchatantra. Panchatantra is a tale of two women claim ownership of a baby. To determine the real mother, the wise minister Vishnu Sharma suggests the test. He proposes that the baby be placed in the middle of a circle and that both women pull the child. The real mother, filled with maternal love, relinquishes her claim, thus revealing herself to be the true mother. Then you have the account in Solomon. The king said, this one, my son, is alive, your son is dead. While well, that one says, no, your son is dead and mine is alive. Then the king said, bring me a sword. So he brought a sword for the king. The woman, whose sword, the woman whose son was alive was deeply moved out of love for her son and said to the king, please, my lord, give her the living baby. Don't kill him. But the other said, neither I nor you shall have him. Okay, so we can kind of see the same kind of story, same kind of stuff. All right, cool. Um, Interesting, interesting, interesting. So the Panchatantra, as mentioned earlier, is estimated to have been composed around the 3rd century BCE, whereas the book of Proverbs is a part of the Hebrew Bible, Old Testament, and is believed to have been written between the 10th to the 6th centuries BCE. Therefore, the Panchatantra predates the book of Proverbs by several centuries. Even though we know the story of that's in the book of Kings, still dealing with the same time frame as Solomon, what not, what have you. So the Panchatra, you see the story there. King Solomon and King Sargon II. So King Solomon, again, there's no evidence for a guy called King Solomon. I don't know if you know about that or you're new to that, but there's no evidence for King Solomon, not in his temple. There's not even a lot of there's not even any evidences for David. In fact, they've winged a lot of evidences for King David. I know that's going to upset people. People have invested a lot of energy, time, resources into certain narratives that are mythological and not historical. Myself included, I didn't know. I was not taught to look at the historicism behind these things. I just thought all these things were already proven. So then when I started to check it out and prove it for myself, I realised a lot of this stuff's not even proven. We picked up a book, we fell in love with a book, but we haven't even tested if there's any historicity behind the book. Outside of the book saying that it's historical, there's no other historical sources saying it's historical. That's like reading a book of, I don't know, um, Donkey Kong, and Donkey Kong saying it's true, it's true, and Donkey Kong inside the book of Donkey Kong saying it's true. Then when you go outside of the book of Donkey Kong, there's no book verifying Donkey Kong. You understand? That's why I say you can't really use Batman to verify Spider-Man. You can't be using Psalms to verify Proverbs because it's still part of the same book, that anthology. You understand? So it doesn't make no sense. But religious people, they do that. And then if they can't fill in the gap, they'll say faith, which is just be ignorant. I don't know. They'll just say, I don't know. Hmm. Something seems a bit suspect. They always have a little buzzword or they say, Satan is doing something. And like, oh, come on. Stop being silly. Use your brain. We're going to keep going though. So King Solomon was greater in riches and wisdom than all the other kings of the earth. The whole world saw audience with Solomon to hear the wisdom God had put in his heart. Again, even with Solomon, Sheba and the stories that we've heard, and there's a reason why they get taught, but there's no historicity behind them. Outside of folklore, tales and myth, which are going to upset the Rastamandim and upset some of the Ethiopic-centric people then. What fact over fiction, one drug addiction. So King Sargon II, inscription of Sargon II, 
the great king, the mighty king, the king of the universe, the king of Assyria, the governor of Babylon, the king of Sumer, Akkad, the king of the four quarters of the world. Most of the plagiarization that the Bible has done is the plagiarize a lot from Babylon, the plagiarize a lot from Persia, the plagiarize a lot from other places. But remember I said earlier, it's not really plagiarizing if you're just taking bits and pieces um, to benefit your people or to benefit a particular narrative that you want to push for moral improvement, you know. And a lot of the old world is very much interconnected, especially in a region of Mesopotamia. There was always interconnected information exchange. Anyway, let's continue this advance. So, that's Sargon the second, right? Then you have Sargon the first. So this is Sargon, this is Moses, this is Sargon. Again, man, I wasn't taught to look at the evidences behind the thing. I just thought, lead, go blind by faith into everything that's written and it is written and all these buzzwords people use, it's not their fault. They've been conditioned and programmed to have the certain knee-jerk responses and anytime something goes against their programming, they become irritable, triggered. And I understand that I have no animosity towards anybody. If I heard this two years ago, I'd probably be like upset myself. I get it. But I've come to a point now, it's just fact over fiction. So birth and infancy, in the case of Sargon, he was founded by a gardener and raised as his son. So he's put in a basket, sent down the water. Found by a man, raises his son, becomes a leader, becomes a king, and does all these mighty, wonderful deeds and things for his people. Then you have the Exodus story, again, not proven, myth. Moses gets placed in a basket by his mother to save him from being killed by the Egyptian pharaoh. He, gets, he then gets discovered by the pharaoh's daughter, who raises him as a prince of Egypt. So you can see the same story of Sargon the first, Moses. Then you have Cat Moses, who leads a military campaign against the Hyksos, who incidentally are the people in the story that were driven to the water and almost decimated in battle. So when you hear about the pharaoh drowning in the sea, that's a cock and bull story. That's made up. It's fake. The actual story is reverse. The pharaohs drew the Hyksos, so the Hebrews, to the water and defeated them. And managed to reclaim some territory, particularly in the northern part of Egypt. His actions paved the way for his younger brother, At Moses I, or At Moses I, to complete the expulsion of the Hyksos Hebrews and establish the 18th dynasty, marking the beginning of the new kingdom period in ancient Egypt. So they've switched it, meshed it, and just done all kinds of stuff to that story. I'd encourage you to watch Exodus, the other side of the story. You're going to probably have to watch it two, three times. You know, if you see a video and it's about two hours long, that means there's been a considerable amount of editing, uh, watching, and just, there's been a lot of work gone into it. It's not no quick thing to do two hours, two and a half hours. That means there's a lot of info that's gone into that. Just watching those videos once, you won't get every bit of information. It's like watching a movie. You'll get more as you watch it and watch it. Watch it a couple of times and then things will connect. Because there's not a lot of evidences for a lot of these things. In my opinion, which is backed by some facts. Now, we'll move on from there. We've looked at these ones before, but we're going to go somewhere else in, in, in a second. So looking back, you have Orpheus and Urdius. In the myth, Orpheus' wife Urdius dies and Orpheus descends into the underworld to retrieve her. Hades allows Urdius to return with Orpheus under the condition that he doesn't look back until he reaches the surface. Similar to Lot's wife, Urdius' return is contingent on her husband's obedience to his command. Orpheus, like Lot's wife, fails due to his curiosity and disobeys the command, causing Urdius to be lost forever. Both stories highlight the consequences of disobeying divine or supernatural instructions out of curiosity or doubt. So you have the story of him losing his wife, he loses um, his, his, his wife. Looking back, looking back. Then you got the Tower of Babel. It's not unique to the Genesis account. There's another story of Tower of Babel. Um, people get scattered. 
um, language and all that kind of stuff you see in the in the story of the myth. So when it comes to Sumerian texts and other things outside of the Bible narrative, they're often just referred to as myths. But when it comes to the Bible account, it's always referred to as factual or historical. But then when you check it out, outside of the narrative, it's not necessarily um, historical and it's not necessarily necessarily always factual. You understand? But when it comes to these other texts, they, at least they're honest and say, it's, it's myth, it's myth, it's myth. So you have another story of the Tower of Babel. You have loads of different stories of Noah's Ark. That's just one in particular. You have loads and loads and loads. Hercules and Samson. In the case of Hercules, one of his famous feats involved slaying the Neum lion as part of his 12 labors. Similarly, in the biblical story of Samson, recounted in the book of Judges, Samson encounters a lion while traveling to Timnah. The Spirit of the Lord comes on Samson, gives him strength to tear the lion apart with his bare hands as if it were a young goat. Also, the Hercules and Samson parallel too. Samson's strength lies in his hair and Hercules' strength lied in his strength, right? And then his wife uh, was misguided or misinformed and gave him a poisonous tunic or a poisonous t-shirt or something like that. And that poisonous t-shirt made him get weak and he became vulnerable just like Samson. So you can actually see a lot in that story as well. Obviously, when Samson got his hair cut, he became weak and vulnerable. When his, when Hercules' wife gave him a t-shirt by accident, on purpose, by you know, you see a lot of similarities and overlappings between the two stories. Furthermore, both have tragic love stories. So Hercules and Samson both have tragic love stories. Hercules' wife, Megara, and Samson's first wife, who is unnamed in the Bible, are central figures in their respective narratives. Both women are tragically affected by their husband's struggles and suffer as a result. Both Hercules and Samson are betrayed by women. Hercules is driven mad by Hera and kills his wife Megara and their children. Samson is betrayed by Delilah, who betrays his secret of strength to his enemies, leading to his capture and subsequent downfall. Lastly, both stories contain an element of redemption through sacrifice. So both Hercules and Samson achieve redemption through their acts or actions of sacrifice. Hercules, after committing terrible deeds in a fit of madness, performs his 12 labors as a form of penance. Samson, after his capture and blindness, brings down the temple of the Philistine god Dagon, killing himself and his enemies, thus bringing deliverance to his people. We looked at this one as well, Agamon, Jephthah and Abraham. Both narratives share the theme of a father sacrificing his daughter. So in the Greek, you got a guy who sacrifices his daughter to the gods. Then in the Bible text, you got a, a man who sacrifices his daughter to the God. Then, in, in, then you have the Abraham, he's told to sacrifice his son, but at the last minute, he's told not to. So his son doesn't get sacrificed. But in the story of the Greek, and in the story of the Hebrew um, the case of Japhtar, they all kill their daughters. Mosai doesn't intervene and stop the daughter being killed in the Bible account. And in the Greek account, there's no intervention either. In fact, in the Greek account, there's two versions. One say that he does kill, and then the other version says that he has a change of heart or something like that. In the Bible account, the man kills a daughter due to an oath that he's made. So after this father kills his daughter based on an oath that he's made, it kind of evolves into like a Israelite tradition, an ordinance, lamentation, commemoration, which is then celebrated four days in a year, annually. So both narratives share the theme of a father sacrificing his daughter, albeit in different contexts and for different reasons. They explore the complex moral dilemmas posed by vows made to gods and the tragic consequence of human actions. These stories serve as a potent reminder of the importance of careful consideration and ethical decision making, even in the face of religious or societal pressures. Some people don't want you to talk about certain things. That's societal pressure. I don't want to upset the society. I don't want to upset the culture. And like, Rob, forget it. If it's fact, it's fact. If it's fiction, it's fiction. That's it. Don't let people scare you out of saying anything because they're afraid of where things could go and how their reality might be disturb disturbed. But is it disturbed? If someone's saying the truth and bringing out 
the evidence is no. What's disturbing is that how we've been so conditioned to live our life full of things that are not true as if they are true. When they're myths, I couldn't believe it. When you actually just really just step back and pause, man. What the heck? <laughs> anyway. Why are people dedicating their lives to follow a book with no evidence, with evidence against it, that's written by anonymous authors? This is madness! This is the Bible. The Jews were never slaves in Egypt. Like the rest of the Bible, it's a mix of myth and legend. And it's about time that we start embracing reality. So what is a mythology? Let's define a word first before we... Let's qualify words. Mythology definition. Mythology from the Greek mythos, for story of the people, and logos, for word or speech. So the spoken story of a people, that's a mythology. So what is it? It's the study and interpretation of often sacred tales or fables of a cultural known as myths or the collections of such stories which deal with various aspects of human condition, good and evil. Let's investigate polytheism and monotheism now. Polytheism and uh, monotheism. So remember I said, yeah, if there was no God, people would invent one. Why? Because there's questions we need answering. And some people make God in their own image, like we're making AI. And the most logical thing AI could say, if it was ever asked if there was a creator, is yeah. What would be the AI's proof? The fact that there's AI it means they were created by someone and we're their creators, right? So if there was no God, people would invent one because we have answers that we have questions that need answering. And people want these questions answered. You understand? So if there was no God, people would invent one. Now, 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 now. As we get to this polytheism part and this monotheism part, many cultures, many, many, many cultures believed in polytheism. Over time, it became monotheism. And this is where everyone says, God is one, God is one. It's one God, one God. Everyone believes in one God. And I was speaking to my religion today and I was saying, if the God guy said that it's not good for man to be alone, yeah, it's not good for man to be alone, apparently because he was looking at the animals and saw that Adam was, you know, upset, disturbed, because he's by himself. So if we are made in God's image, according to the stories and stuff, we're made in God's image. God makes one man and realizes, whoa, hold up, it's, uh, maybe a blunder or maybe whatever. He says, okay, boom, it's not good for man to be alone. It's just not good for man to be alone. And we're made in his image. So would then God be alone? Is God an old man with white hair and a white beard and sitting in a rocking chair with angels singing holy, 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 which is kind of narcissistic, all day is just listening to angels sing about himself on a chair? Is that it? And is that it? Like he's sitting in a chair and he's listening to the radio. Is that it? We're going to investigate this. I know that sounds a bit, ooh, that doesn't sound nice, that a question to ask. But that question is asked to engage some thoughts, like to get people to think. Because oftentimes we don't, and we're not encouraged to think. So in the book says, listen, it's not good for man to be alone. But yet he's alone and we're made in his image. Does that make any sense? I'm just asking. Not only that then, but he has a son, but there's no, I don't know, it gets interesting. Our whole fight, I won't even go there just yet. We need to, bring some evidences out because people have been programmed to see the world from a kind of very male-centric perspective without the balance of a female which then leads to a lot of this homosexuality and this kind of anti-feminine thing that happens in many many styles of religions and then people have never put two and two together and wondered why there's a bit of funny 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 things and a funny funny kind of mm -mm spirit that is in a lot of these so-called religious places and where a lot of religious men like to do things with religious boys I, 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 I will get there though so anyway so 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 you had this polytheism thing where there's like plethora of gods and deities and then over time it became the one 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 all right which is fine no issue so here's polytheism all right so there's polytheism all right so you have china they had a pantheon which means like a plethora of different deities um, then you have the greeks they had a pantheon which is kind of modeled off the egyptian pantheon and 
Then you have the Canaanite pantheon, which was a, a bastardized version of all kinds of pantheons. And then you had the Arab pantheon. And then over time, monophysium or monotheism was the war of the gods. Which god of the pantheon will be the main god? Which god of the statues, which god of the, well, technically put it like this. If your god is not my god, then your gods are idol, right? So which was the supreme god of the pantheon? Pantheons were a place that were dedicated to idols anyway. But why is it idol? If my one, I regard this idol as the god idol, then your idol that's not this idol is an idol to my god. And so on and so forth. And so on and so forth. So if I put it like this, let's make it Pokemon related, right? I choose the Pikachu deity. You choose the Bulbasaur deity. Yeah? Now your Bulbasaur deity is Satan because it's against my Pikachu deity. And my Pikachu deity is the real deity because I've selected this Pikachu deity out of all the other Pokemon deities. But essentially you had all these different deities in a pantheon and I started to condense them little by little, little by little, little by little. And over time it just became male based, male centric. We're gonna see as we go through. You will see, don't be scared just because we're entertaining different strains of thought. So gods of old were considered more than one with a superior one. So gods of old were considered more than one with a superior one. It's difficult to have a council meeting of the gods if there are no other gods. How is God just sitting on a rocking chair listening to holy, holy, holy 24 hours a day with nothing to govern? How can you be a god and have no government? How can you be a king and have no um, kingdom? How can you just, what is going on? So we're going to see then. So let's go. So Psalms 82 verse 1. God stands in the congregation of the mighty. He judges among the gods. God standeth in the assembly of God. He judges, for, judges among the gods. God stands in the assembly of El. Interesting. God stands in the assembly of El. In the midst of the gods, he renders judgment. Interesting. People, are getting, people might be getting a bit disturbed, like, God is one! No one's knocking you for your oneness. It's okay, man. I'm glad that you feel that way. It's good. I just told you as well, I showed you. Gods of old were considered more than one with a superior one. All right? Have no other gods before me. There was, anyway, let's continue. What were these gods before me? The other gods in the pantheon. The other, anyway. So, God stands in the congregation of the mighty. He judges among the gods. God standeth in the assembly of God. He judges among the gods. God standeth in the assembly of El. In the midst of the gods, he renders judgment. Then you have other versions where they don't say gods. They say angels. So now we see gods have been demoted to angels. Then you have other versions where the angels are now demoted to judges. But essentially, in most of the other versions, it was God stands in the congregation of gods, the assembly of gods, the assembly of El. Alright? There was a day in Job when it says all the gods came, or the angels came, or the sons of God came, and Satan came among them. So you can see there's, a, there's, a, there's definitely uh, another civilization, another realm, another place where there's many different types of people, gods, angels, whatever you want to call them societies, elders, whatever they are. There's definitely another place where these people, if we're going to go by this text at least, exist. But is it only just found in Psalms? Remember, we looked at something because we're doing a scientific study right now. We're doing a scientific study right now. Let's go back to the statement, or the theory, so we can prove his theory. We want to see if his theory is fake or real. Not by emotions, but by... Logic, application, and methodology. He suggested biblical narratives were not unique, but were adaptations of borrowing from other ancient myths and legends. 
This idea proposes that the theme motives and narratives found in the Bible can be found in other cultures and religions throughout the ancient world. Remember somebody said something as well earlier, they said the Most High, and I said, hmm, that's interesting because the Most High has a multitude of applications. And this is not to demonize or stigmatize anyone who says Most High and make a crazy religious religion out of Most High and, you know, go crazy and, you know, spout cast on people, say you can't say this and you should say, no, 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 no. But I'm going to show you that there's multiple applications for a lot of things that we say. All right. So let's continue. And be, be careful of them people that try to scare you into all kinds of dumb stuff, man. Oh, don't say this. Don't say that. And it's crazy talk, man. Loud him. Now, back to this. So you have this monothe polytheism thing. Monotheism. Truth be told. Even though this is Canaan, this is also Hebrew pantheon or Israelite pantheon too. Because the Israelites were caught up into this pantheon as well. Or the Hebrew or the Hyksos or whatever you want to call them. So you had the Kemet pantheon over here you had the israelite pantheon slash canaanite pantheon you have the arab pantheon you have the chinese pantheon you have the greek pantheon you have the monotheism the war of the gods when they started removing certain gods one by one certain gods that fell out of favor with the people certain gods that weren't really kicking no more yesterday gods all right and then they started consolidating it to a single god but it got to a point where they started consolidating it, but they still kept the god and the goddess, essentially the, the dad and the mom, and then they just relegated it to dad. You'll see it anyway. So gods of old were considered more than one with the superior one. So here was the, the Canaanite pantheon. So here's El. So El often depicted as the father of the gods and the creator deity. El was associated with kingship, Authority and fertility, you have Asherah, you have Baal, we've looked at all this already, right? Cool. Then we've looked at the Canaanite pantheon, you have the Father, El, you have Yahweh, Son, you have Baal, the Son, all of these were just idols in a pantheon. But when I say idol, if you selected the god of Dagon, then Yahweh was an idol to you. If you selected the dog of Baal, then Yahweh was an idol to you. If you selected the idol Yahweh, then Baal was a say it into you you understand how it works it's like a football team if you go with that jersey then that jersey that isn't your jersey is your opponent and you just saw a lot of this in-house fighting over the supremacy of which one was the best one and stories and mythologies given to support why their one was the best one for example when you go back to the ancient near east in ancient mesopotamia the city states often had their own patron deity when one city-state conquered another, they sometimes took the idols of the defeated city's gods and placed them in a subordinate position in their own temples. This act served to demonstrate the superiority of the conquering city's deity over those of the defeated city. Similarly, in ancient Egypt, pharaohs who wanted to assert their dominance over foreign lands would sometimes depict themselves smiting the gods of the conquered people, symbolizing the victory of their own gods over the gods of the defeated. Moving forward in time, during the medieval period, during the spread of Christianity in Europe, pagan idols and symbols were sometimes demonized by Christian missionaries. For example, in the Middle Ages, some pagan statues and symbols were repurposed or destroyed to establish the dominance of Christianity over pagan beliefs. Colonial period. During the age of European colonialism, Christian missionaries often portrayed indigenous idols and deities as demonic or evil in order to convert the indigenous peoples to Christianity. This practice was common in regions such as the Americas, Africa and Asia. Now, in modern times, conflicts between religious groups sometimes involved the demonization of the other group's religious symbols, Beliefs and idols. Now, there was another one as well. You had this Yahweh, you had this Baal, you had this El, you had this Astarate or Astaroth, and you had all of these things which were associated with the, the Canaanite pantheon. 
another person chose an idol that wasn't your idol, then you'll demonize their idol and say they were doing all wicked stuff to that idol or evil stuff to that idol because now you want to demonize it so that people join your idol. So it's like a fight for the idols, right? So you have an idol called Kadesh, which is also called Kadesh, which is a goddess associated with love, sexuality, sensuality, wisdom as well. She was often depicted in seas of fertility, eroticism. Kadesh depicted wearing the headdress. So she wore a headdress, which you see these judges wear in England, a headdress or a wig. And she was standing on a lion. So one of the symbols of the Hyksos people was a lion. Conquering lion. <laughs> yeah, so one of their symbols was a lion. So there's Kadesh. Kadesh, Kadesh. Mother, female, wisdom, Kadesh. Canaanite pantheon. When you go into your old Bibles and you look at Proverbs and you put wisdom and put she, you'll find it refers to wisdom as she. You go to um, the other one, wisdom of Solomon, you put wisdom, it's always referring to her as a she, she, a she. Then many in today's Western society, they hate anything that sounds like it could be female related because there's a lot of strong sexism and a lot of weird misunderstandings of symbols and figurative speaking and stuff like that. So when they hear wisdom associated with a woman, they start getting all crazy. And they say, oh, feminism! But they have these buzzword knee-jerk reactions, you know, like Pavlov's dog. But essentially, you have Kadesh in the pantheon of the Canaanites. And one of the interesting battles with the pharaohs and the Hyksos, who later changed their name to many different names, was the battle of Kadesh. You know, so there's a lot of multiplicities behind this word Kadesh. Now aside from that though, I just want you to see that Kadesh stands on a lion. This is one of the symbols of the Hyksos or the Canaanites was the lion. In the Arab pantheon now, you have the chief, again, often a man. The man's often a chief. In all the pantheons, the chief is a man. Yeah? Zeus, man. Hera, his consort, is a woman. His wife, Hera, woman. All right? Osiris and Isis. Osiris, man. Isis, woman. In the night pantheon, or Israelite pantheon, El. And then you had, um, I think it might be Astaroth or whatever her name is. You always had these two. Then over time, they started to, God is one, God is one. And everyone's fighting each other over which one they want to be the best one. So you have a chief man, you have a chief woman. Check out that. So what you're seeing there is Manat in the Arab pantheon, which is the, the chief woman. Then in the Hebrew pantheon, you have Kadesh. Then in the Canaanite pantheon, you have Kadesh. And in the Arab pantheon, you have Manat. Or Al-Manat. And notice... The same symbol is, is standing on the lion. So you can see it's just the same story, hijacked or not hijacked, because that sounds very nefarious, but repurposed and taken, re retaken, resold, reinvigorated, redistributed back to the community. Then over time, oh, we don't like these goddess gods. Let's get rid of them. Let's just have Hubal. You know, let's just keep it a Hubal thing, which then became Allah. Oh, we don't like these gods. We don't like these, um, what you call it, these Kadeshes and Astaroths and all this kind of stuff. We don't like Baal no more, he's fell out of favour. Let's keep it Yahweh, let's keep it El. Now when you go to Ma'a in ancient Egyptian religion, the, pers the, pers the personification of truth and justice and cosmic order, the principle of wisdom, is Ma'at. Yeah, it's just a it's just symbolic of principle, wisdom, da -da 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 -da, truth and justice, cosmic order, whatever you want to call it. So here you have the Arab pantheon, and here you have the Egyptian pantheon. You've been weighed in the balance and found wanting. You'll find all these symbols and all these little re refer references in other places. It's not unique to one place. 
even though you've been we've been engineered to think in one way. Another interesting fact is that the Aramaic or the Paleo-Hebrew or whatever it's called, the word for science, knowledge, thought, intelligence, consciousness was Mada or Mada, which sounds like Manat or Maat. Mada. In English, it means mother. And interestingly, many of us were formed in our mother's womb, which just so happens to be called Matrix. Interesting. So you have Homer's Iliad. Homer's Iliad. Homer's Iliad predates the Septuagint. Homer's Iliad is traditionally dated to the 8th century BCE, though it is based on the oral traditions that likely go back even further. The Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible Old Testament, was completed by Jewish scholars in Alexandria, Egypt in the 3rd century BCE. All right. Therefore, the composition of the Iliad precedes the translations of the Hebrew scriptures into Greek by several centuries. All right. So what we're about to read now predates the Hebrew Septuagint. Uh, it, it just predates it as a document, as a complete document. In fact, when you start even questioning the Septuagint, you find a lot of weird stuff. There's no actual evidences for the Septuagint or the Old Testament. There's not a lot of evidence for a lot of these things, bro. Outside of the hocus pocus of what we've been told throughout our lives, when you start asking, okay, okay, Septuagint, um, so what was before that? Or how did that get made? You find a lot of crazy stories, bro. Just like people are talking in the air. <laughs> yeah? Like literally. And you're like, oh, that's a bit suspect. But let's just leave it as Septuagint is a real thing and it was all legit and there's no remixing or bastardization it's just an, an authentic um document of documents right it was still put together first century in egypt in alexandria the same place where they burnt the libraries down fascinating stuff so going back to this then this homer's iliad predates the septuagint now i want to show a show a few things in this documentation <laughs> listen the iliad is an interesting read man the iliad is a very interesting read I want to quickly summarize very briefly though before we get into that because that's going to be the last part of this presentation hopefully everyone's doing well and um managed to keep up and if you haven't replay watch it later at your own convenience it's some complete up to you so i've shown you that in these pantheons there was several deities male female one of thunder one of fire and essentially there were symbols metaphorical symbols yeah just like you have symbols for a car that associates it with a particular brand. 
So these were brands, essentially. Mercedes brand, BMW brand, the Dagon brand, the Ball brand. And people made these gods into brands. And then they were fighting over their brand. I have the brand of Marduk and Baal is the evil one. And then those who subscribe to Baal was, I have the brand of Baal and Dagon is the evil one. And that's just what you do in these cults, right? Um, but essentially that's all it was, these pantheons. And then over time, someone said, no, let's reduce it to one. So then you had them fighting over which one was the best one. My one is better than your one because my text says so. No, my one's better than your one because this text says so. And then that was essentially what people were doing, firefighting. Now, going to this now, Homer's Liliad. Let's read. Now the dawn, so this is the most high God. Let's listen out for the references. Now the dawn saffron road was spreading over the face of all the earth. And Zeus that hurleth the thunderbolt made a gathering of the gods upon the top most peak. So he throws a thunderbolt as like a phone call. Yo guys, let's link up. A gathering the gods. Upon the top, topmost peak of the many rigid Olympus, and himself addressed their gathering. And all the gods gave ear. Sounds like the book of Job, isn't it? Hearken unto me, all ye gods and goddesses, that I may speak what the heart in my breast biddeth me. Let not any goddess, nor yet any god, essay this thing to forth my word. But do ye all alike assent thereto, that with all the speed I may bring these deeds to pass? Whomsoever shall I mark minded apart from the gods to go and bear aid, either to the Trojans or the Dance, smitten in no seemingly wise shall he back to Olympus, or I shall take and hurl him into murky Tartarus? Far, far away, where is the deepest gulf beneath the earth? The gates whereof are of iron, and the threshold of bronze, as far beneath Hades as heaven is above the earth. Then shall you know how far the mightiest am I of all gods. Nay, come, make trial ye gods, that ye all may know. Make ye fast from a heaven a chain of gold, and lay ye hold thereof all ye gods, and all goddesses. Yet could ye not drag to earth from out of heaven Zeus, the counsellor, most high? Not though ye have laboured sore, but when so I were minded to draw of a ready heart, then with the earth itself should I draw you, and with sea, with all. So in that text then, it's talking about having a little assembly of the gods. Assembly of the Gods. Keep saying that. Assembly of the Gods. Um, assembly of the Gods. Interesting as well that when you read the book of Job, you do see, obviously it was Septuagint Greek and stuff like that, right? But you do see a lot of Greek terminologies in the book of Job in terms of the constellations and seven sisters. So is it seven sisters? I think even in Micah or one of them lesser prophet books, you see a lot of allusions to the constellations that are in the Greek as well. So anyway, so yeah, so you have an assembly of the gods, right? This is where people get freaked out. They're like, are you saying that God is Zeus? And I'm like, bro, I'm saying all these gods have the same background story because it's the same story but given to a different audience it's the same story but given to an opponent a satan if you are against this particular pantheon you're a satan to... it's politics bro religion was used as politics it's still used as politics today you know what i'm saying it's always been politics so anyway that man have a meeting it's on top of a mountain and now because he's on top of the mountain he's known as the most high you see the same symbolisms in the in the scriptures too. Even the same language, you see the same formation. It's the same blows and skirt thing, is all I'm saying to people. Right? I know people are very religious-y, very crazy, and all that kind of stuff. And yeah. But if you just take your religious and, and crazy stuff aside and just read, um, you'll see that 
bro, this is why I said the leaders of the world, they don't get taught the same books you get taught. They get taught Latin and classical Greek. Latin and classical Greek. That's what they get taught. We get taught some commoner stuff. We get taught to pray without ceasing, which is cool, but it just means to beg and to beg the lords and the overlords that they may bless our lands and be a good landlord. When you start just decoding and deconstructing the words, because words have power, but if you don't know what the words mean, then you're powerless. So when you start to understand the word and walk in your purpose as a God on this earth that has dominion, just as they have dominion, then you don't get caught up in all of this technology and you don't see anybody as a threat. You see everybody as a brother, a sister. You just see everybody in love because you realize everyone's been lied to and everyone's under some sort of spell. You understand? So when you read these things now then, you can appreciate, you can see where a lot of things mesh and come from, so on and so forth. So we're going to see a little bit more then. So that's the Most High God reference. So father and sons. So in the Greek pantheon, the fathers were always fighting their sons. There was always some kind of beef with dads and sons and dads killing sons and sons fighting dads and not happy with it and all kinds of stuff. So the father and his sons, there through the gate, they drove, they drove their horses patient of the gold of the, uh, one second, I hate that on the screen. Almost finishing as well, man. Almost finishing. Let's wrap up. Let's move very quickly. All right. Father and son. There through the gate, they drave their horses, patient of the gold. And they found the son of Kronos as he sat apart from the other gods on the topmost peak of many rigid Olympus. Then the goddess, white-armed Hera, stayed the horse and made question of Zeus the Most High, the son of Kronos, and spake to him, Father Zeus, has thou no indignation for Ares for these, si these violent deeds that he hath destroyed so great and so godly a host of the Achaeans, recklessly and in soul, seemingly wise to my sorrow? While at they ease, Cyprus and Apollo, of the silver bowl, take their joy, having set on this madman that regret of, re regardeth not any law. So notice he was breaking the laws of the Greeks. Every nation had a pantheon. The pantheon had a legal structure. The pantheon had a social structure, the pantheon had an economic structure, the pantheon had a priest structure. It's just government. Break out of the spell and just understand the pantheons were a part of government and control, not for good reasons or bad reasons. It's just the way you govern people, because if they don't have God, they'll make one. So the state makes gods for people, gives them a god, gives them pastors, gives them imams, gives them all these things. And you know what? If, you, if that's what you need, that's what you need, isn't it? But essentially, that's what it is. Okay? Um, that's what it's always been. It's a system like that. Now, am I saying there's no creator? I have to answer that question at the beginning. But I'm saying all these religions and things that people are dying, dying over, fighting over, yeah, you're going to be shot. So anyway, uh, then the goddess, this, that, and the other. Um, so she's saying this, that, and the other, blah, 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 blah. Pointing out from that then, the mother goddess is talking to the father goddess the father god and saying listen your sons are squabbling they're not listening to the law they're being reckless they're being wayward you need to put them in order you need to keep them in check according to the story all right according to the myth Then it says, but of thee, where is it, where is it, where is it, where is it? Come on, stop doing that all the time, my brother. Anyway, but of thee, I reck not in thy anger. No, not vo thou shouldest go. Even the language, even when you look how it's written, it just sounds, I know it just sounds very Bible-y. But we're going to look as well. We've got another presentation to do. Well, I told you already. We're going to be looking at the scholars and what they've had to say. I'm not a scholar. Yeah, I don't have the seal of approval. <laughs> but we're going to look at scholars from various disciplines. We're going to do the same scientific study of seeing what they had to say. And I guarantee you'll be like, whoa, hold on. You think it's just me saying that the Exodus is a hoax and it's fake? No. People have been saying it for ages. 
but they don't get the platform because it goes against the narrative. Before the certain narrative, there was this narrative that made people emphasize with a certain narrative. You have to understand how politics works. Now check this. But a V I reck not in by anger, no not vol thou should go us to the never responds of the earth and sea. Where abide the Flaptuus and the Kronos, and have joy neither in the rays of Helios, Hypernian, nor in any breeze, but deep Tartarus is round about them. Though thou shouldest fare even thither in wanderings, yet reck I not of thy wrath, seeing there is a naught more shameless than thou. So said he, how be it, white on terror, speak no word in answer. Then into ocean, oceanus thou the bright light of the sun drawing black night over the face of the earth, the giver of grain. Surely against the will of the Trojans sank the daylight, but over welcome a price prayed for. So they were praying rel relentlessly to the gods. The gods and the pantheons love a lot of prayer as well, because then it shows um, devotion and so on and so forth. So pray. They will always instruct them to pray. In fact, there's a story, uh, a movie actually, where people stop praying to, to, to the particular pantheons and the gods will vex, because you have to understand how religion works as well. The people get hoodwinked to pay their money for them to build a temple of God. Then the pastor says, will a man rob God? So after you help this man build his own blimmin' temple, he's got the audacity to tell you, will a man rob God? <laughs> he built his temple for him, now he's telling you, will a man rob God? Not only that, when the temple's built, the temple needs maintenance. The temple needs electricity bill. The temple needs water bill. Uh, the temple needs groundkeeping, the temple needs a caretaker, the temple needs somebody to be there for when they do the weddings, somebody there when they do the funerals. The temple needs a lot of support, you understand? Um, and that's how it is, and that's how it's always been. And, and again, these are not always bad systems if they're used ethically. And this is why I don't discourage people from going to a church. Go to church, man. Go to church. You might learn something. <laughs> go to where you need to go to, man. Have a good day. Live the best life. Yeah, at the same time though, just know why these things are there in the first place. I'm not discouraging people from going to a church. Go to church. Go to where you feel comfortable. But just understand why it's there in the first place. Just understand. Outside of the narrative of the book, there's a narrative of the structure, especially when it goes to economics, commerce, and how you build civilizations. Okay? Now, back to this though. So I've got probably one more left and we're done. So this guy's blasphemed the father's name, Zeus, by invoking other gods, by naming, calling upon other gods. So Zeus in the story has become um, frustrated because why are you calling on them other gods? Not me. All right. But when she had sworn and made an end of the oath, the twain left the cities of Lemnos and Imbros and clothed about in a mist went forth, speeding swiftly on their way. Too many fountained Ida they came, the mother of the wild creatures, even to Lectum, where they first left the sea, and the twain fared on over the dry land, and the topmost part and the topmost forest quivered beneath their feet. Their sleep did halt, or ever the eyes of Zeus beheld him, and mounted up on the fir tree exceedingly tall. The highest that then grew in Ida, it reached up through the mist into heaven. So you have there an example of giant trees, mega trees reaching unto heaven. So again, in all these stories, yeah, you can read them as literal if it helps you. In your, if it helps you in your daily life, then cool, man. Everything's literal. You know, if it's making you a good person and you're, you're helping your community and serving people and looking after you, yourself and your own mental health and own well-being and other people, then fine, man. Do you know what I mean? Like, I ain't trying to police no one. Do what you think is best because tomorrow what you think is best might change. If you're a thinker. With that being said though, we've looked at this, I'm going to summarize. The Bible documents, early Christian and Judaic traditions, rituals, cultural practices, significant events, offerings, offering insights into social political context of their time. Cultural identity, the Bible plays a crucial role in shaping cultural identity for Judaic or Hebraic or Christian communities worldwide. It's over like 4 billion people man. It defines shared beliefs, values, practices that unify believers and provide a sense of communal identity and continuity across generations. We have seen the change from polytheism, God, and goddesses 
to monotheism, simply nail God alone. We have seen the Bible stories are not all unique. Many stories found in the Bible can be paralleled or have similarities in other ancient texts and cultures. For example, the flood narratives similar to Noah's Ark can be found in Mesopotamian stories, like the Epic of Gilgamesh, and in the ancient Greek mythology, the story of the Decalon, Ira, stories of the creation, divine laws, heroic figures like Moses leading the people out of Egypt can also be found in other cultures, culture or cultural and religious traditions worldwide. These similarities suggest that the biblical narratives often reflected universal themes and motives that resonate across different cultures and historical periods. All right, so that's that done, summarization done. What stood out to you the most? What story did you didn't know was a parallel? Um, as you're maybe thinking, let's end on this quote. He suggested that biblical narratives were not unique, but were adaptations borrowing from other ancient myths and legends. Proposes that the themes, motives, and narratives found in the Bible can be found in other cultures and religions throughout the ancient world. That was involved in this nation called Facts over fiction, one drug addiction. Tell the truth, they get scared, you get convicted. <laughs> and now you've got a conviction. Globally, I believe a vote from a monkey. Globally, I believe we went to the moon. Globally, I believe everything's a fact. If it's fact checked, then my brother, that's a fact. I'm loyal to the Lord and the King of the manor. Give to Caesar, Serapis, and Hosanna. When I looked into the facts, I couldn't see facts, so I stammered. All I could see was a lot of happy Sabbaths, prophecy hopes tell them the truth my brother debbie shattered keep my thoughts to myself mom gave me manners a lot of more razor simply bible scammers one fire upon that one fire upon that one fire upon that one fire upon that one fire upon